Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, depending on on from where you uh, I are, are you listening to us today. Uh, first of all, and before we start, I would like to uh, you know, thank the organizers of the Marietta College uh, Earth and uh, sorry Earth Energy and Environment uh, Students Conference for the great uh, efforts uh, uh, they have put uh, on this event. Um, now with almost 4,000 people registered uh, from over 80 countries across the globe, it makes it one of the world's uh, sort of largest students' energy conferences. Uh, so happy to see actually how things have been evolving with the, uh, with the conference. Um, and also would like to thank all the attendees uh, for your interest uh, to join us today discussing this uh, important topic the hydrogen. And uh, we promise you that we will have, uh, you know, 60 exciting uh, uh, minutes uh, in the next hour or so. Uh, and why? Because we are, we'll be talking about, uh, uh, with no doubt, the most important topic in the energy sector nowadays, which is basically the hydrogen. And, and also uh, glad to see that we have a mix of industry and academia experts in our panel, uh, appreciate their time and uh, their contribution to, to the panel and to the discussion today. Um, and maybe we can start with a quick introduction uh, uh, for uh, my colleagues on the panel today, uh, and then we can jump into the discussion. So uh, Zainab, if you don't mind, we can uh, you can introduce yourself. Thank you, Salah. Sure. So I'm pleased to participate to this panel discussion uh, on the hydrogen ammonia uh, as playing a role in future energy sources. And thank um, thank you very much, uh, Marietta College and uh, University of uh, of Houston for inviting me. So I, I think uh, I also I'll take this opportunity to highlight the importance uh, to connect and exchange with universities and academia on all technical and uh, economic aspect of hydrogen ammonia as uh, significant players of the energy transition. So my name is Zineb Sigrushni. So I'm in charge of uh, hydrogen uh, strategy and partnerships within John Cochrane, uh, working on developing and tightening collaboration with the key stakeholders of, uh, of the hydrogen and ammonia uh, value chain. Uh, so with the objective to building a viable and sustainable business model uh, enabling scale up of hydrogen and, and, and green, uh, green hydrogen and uh, green ammonia uh, technology and economy. So maybe a few words on Joko Krill for those they don't know. So Joko Krill is working for 200 years on uh, providing answers uh, towards energy transition, but not only trans energy transition, green mobility, safety, sustainable industrial production. So we specialize, uh, speciali our spe uh, specialities in designing and modernizing and maintaining equipment in the field of energy, generation, environmental and industrial applications. So uh, very, very happy to and delighted today to participate uh, to our panel today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zainab. Uh, Rehab? Yes, I am um, Rehab Al Maghrabi. I am an, uh, as a head of the petroleum refinery and petrochemical engineering um, department um, at uh, the Faculty of Petroleum and Mining Engineering at Southeast University. I am also working as adjunct faculty uh, associate professor at uh, the American University in Cairo. Um, actually, I am very happy to join this panel discussion, and it is a very interesting um, um, event to exchange knowledge and um, know more about hydrogen and discuss uh, what is uh, be the new technology and what would be the future of hydrogen and ammonia. Thank you, Engineer Sarah, and thank you for Ahmed and uh, Ms., uh, Dr. Suleiman for organizing this and for being the chair of this event. Thank you. Right, uh, and actually we have also uh, another colleague who was uh, uh, supposed to join us, Carlos uh, Tarillo de, de uh, uh, La Rosa. Uh, he's just experiencing some, some technical issues, but hopefully he will join us in the next uh, few minutes or so. 
Um, I see also that we have now a uh, larger number of participants, uh, people attending the call, over 200 uh, uh, people or so far, which is really great. So I think, you know, uh, we can uh, start with the, the, the first question, um, uh, Zena, back to you. And we all know the, 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 the green hydrogen and uh, that the, uh, uh, the, the, the major technologies to produce the green hydrogen is basically the water electrolysis. Um, and I know that John Cockerell is definitely one of the uh, leading companies in this space. So I would like to make a good use of, you know, having you uh, with us today and ask you if you don't mind to do really to explain the difference between the two major technologies, the PIM and the alkaline, and uh, what from your point of view, the main differences, uh, as well as the advantages, disadvantages adva advantages of, of each of those technologies. Okay, sure, sure. Thank you for, uh, for this question. I think that uh, electrolyzer is uh, pretty known. Uh, or uh, if not, I will refresh maybe uh, for a few seconds uh, what, what we are talking about. So the, the, the electrolysis in, as, as chemical process is very known and has been known since uh, uh, 1800, I mean, more than 200 uh, years. So we know uh, there are, uh, there are uh, four main technologies uh, in the market uh, that all uh, most of players uh, do know under the name of uh, uh, um, uh, alkaline uh, alkaline technology and uh, and then PEM uh, under the name of uh, um, uh, proper exchange membrane. So alkaline electrolyzes. What 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 does it uh, what it does is splitting the water into uh, hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, with applying a voltage into alkaline solution, what we call electrolyte. This is a water mixed with some uh, oxide, uh, uh, oxide potassium. So um, while the PEM, uh, the proton exchange membrane, uh, this is uh, this is uh, this method. It differs. It reverses actually the fuel cell principle and uh, requires no liquid electrolyte as the alkaline uh, does. So the water is pressed through a stack of two electrodes and polymer membrane, and it only and only allows the positive anion. But this is more technical. I, I, we, we don't want to make it like very, very technical session today, Salah. I'm trying to get, just get uh, refreshed. Uh, so the alkaline is more mature uh, technology. So uh, the most installation of for the hydrogen production uh, they are based on alkaline technology, fewer, so very, very uh, mature technology since uh, some, uh, several, several years ago. Uh, the PEM is starting to be, uh, to be uh, more used, uh, especially for decentralized or for small, uh, small capacity of, of green hydrogen uh, production. Uh, talking about the material used between alkaline and PEM, PEM is very known to use uh, the platinum, uh, which is uh, one of the uh, uh, rare material, uh, which is also uh, might be of concern uh, because this is a rare material. Uh, we can, uh, we, uh, I, I have to mention also that there exists other technology, uh, what we call the anion exchange membrane. Uh, this is similar to alkaline electrolysis, allowing uh, negative also charge to pass through the membrane. Uh, but in AM uh, technology, uh, uh, we uh, we avoid to use the costly precious material like uh, metal, like it is the case for the for the PEM. Uh, this is uh, this technology is more suitable for smaller scale. Uh, and for uh, for decentralized uh, application, there is another technology called solar solid oxide electrolyzer cells, uh, known under the name of SOEC. This is more high temperature electrolyzers, where we use ceramic membrane that conduct ions at very high temperatures. So separating, uh, so separating uh, with the, the super using the superheated uh, steam at between 600 and 800 degrees. So separating uh, uh, the steam into oxygen and hydrogen. So these are four uh, technology. The most uh, te install, uh, used installation they're using alkaline 
and PEM uh, technologies. So we all, uh, maybe most of you have heard about, okay, so when when going to, when it comes to select what technology for what application or for what uh, usage uh, or, uh, application for, uh, in terms of the size of the installed uh, uh, green hydrogen uh, plants, um, we have to, uh, based on different studies, we know we, we know that uh, alkaline is more suitable for large scale installation, while PEM more for more decentralized or modular installation. Um, the, the most difference between is uh, sometimes we heard that uh, PEM would be more suitable because we have to remind that green hydrogen is produced using renewable energy sourcing, right? And we know all that renewable energy is inter has uh, intermittent uh, futures. Uh, so the question is uh, how, how does uh, the usage or the technology PEM and alkaline follow the intermittent uh, effects of renewable uh, energy sourcing? Um, so this uh, both technology can follow uh, the, the intermittent and alkaline, especially in between, like uh, you see, not four uh, plus minus four percent. Uh, it can follow up uh, uh, the 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 uh, per second the variation of the intermittent uh, energy sourcing. Um, one big uh, difference, maybe not big difference, but uh, key uh, difference is the. Uh, the, the load factor, what we call uh, at what uh, the, 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 the hydrogen, green hydrogen plant is working on. Uh, th this might be a difference between both technology, the, what we call the minimum lo load for alkaline and PEM. And uh, we, we know, uh, we, we, we see that alkaline can start at, at higher load. Why? Because of the, uh, for, for safety reason. Uh, what we call it uh, for the, uh, the anodic gas impurity in order to prevent any mixture of oxygen in hydrogen, uh, which it has limit uh, of a maximum of 2% two, uh, two or 1.5%. To prevent this mixture, which is uh, safety relevant, uh, might uh, the, the alkaline technology uh, is uh, uh, recommend to, to uh, or the alkaline technology electrolyzers are having a minimum load at starting from 30 to 40 percent to prevent this uh, this uh, this safety this safety issue. But this uh, this point or the technology now uh, can also allow uh, starting at lower loads uh, with the using what we call different loops. Uh, 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 running the electrolyte at, at different loops. So th this is the main, uh, the main, let's say, difference. Uh, but for large scale, uh, this uh, this point or let's say this difference is not relevant for uh, using the alkaline. Why? Because we have uh, we can overcome uh, this uh, the, the, lo the low low uh, load uh, factor with uh, using uh, one uh, starting to produce hydrogen using one. A stack electrolyzer uh, instead of another. Um, so, uh, as a reminder, alkaline technology is uh, used for larger scale. We are talking about more than five, 10, 100, one gigawatt scale, uh, where uh, you have a larger stack like uh, the five megawatt stack offered by Junko Crew. Uh, while PEM, for PEM technology, we see in the market uh, stack uh, of uh, two, uh, 1.5, 2. Uh, to 2.5 uh, megawatts. Uh, I don't want to go through uh, the whole uh, technical aspect, but this no. is the, this would be the let's say the, the main difference. No, I appreciate it, uh, Zainab. Thank you very much. And uh, indeed, it is really interesting to see how things actually uh, you know um, started to evolve a few years ago, because uh, for, exactly. for so many years uh, the alkaline technology has been actually the only technology that everybody uh, used and uh, you know uh, used to talk even about. Uh, but again, ten years ago, we started actually to to hear about the PIM, uh, and now uh, it is really incredible to see, as based uh, the based on the feedback that you got, how things actually started easy even to advance more and more. Uh, not just on the PIM and the alkaline technologies, but also in the new uh, uh, water electrolysis technologies, as, as you kindly uh, mentioned.
uh, very interested, uh, uh, very interesting indeed. Um, maybe now I, I will, I would say that I will, I will take a step back and uh, ask Rehab if, if, um, if, if you can explain really uh, the, the term of the blue hydrogen. So now we understood the green hydrogen, how it is being produced. But also we started recently, uh, I mean, in, in especially in the last two years, it started uh, to see lots of, uh, of key players, uh, key countries, uh, you know, trying to push, you know, uh, towards the blue hydrogen as an intermediate solutions um, uh, that can help us to accelerate the energy transition until, you know, uh, the world has this, you know, more advanced, let us say, water electrolysis technologies. So uh, if it would be really great to hear your thoughts, I mean, first of all, to uh, explain what is blue hydrogen uh, and what is the difference actually in the production uh, uh, technology method between producing the green hydrogen and the blue hydrogen. So um, blue hydrogen in general, it is a stop, um, is the same as gray hydrogen, but in this case, we are using this carbon dioxide emission. So um, gray hydrogen is produced from uh, the Nissan uh, steam reforming. So we use Nissan using a steam, we have the Nissan gas uh, using a steam, it will produce carbon monoxide, sun gas, which, uh, and the hydrogen. And then we are using the, the steam gas, uh, water gas shift reaction where carbon monoxide react with, uh, with the steam and we will produce uh, carbon um, dioxide and more hydrogen. So at the end, we, during this reaction, we're having CO2 emission um, together with the hydrogen production. So we have CO2 and hydrogen. This is called the green hydrogen. In this case, if we utilize this carbon, uh, we like capture this carbon dioxide and then uh, utilize it, store it, whatever we do with this, but we didn't allow it to be emitted to the atmosphere. In this case, we are calling this blue hydrogen. But the, I'm talking about the chemical reaction. There is um, to reach to this chemical reaction, we need um, uh, temperature. So we are using uh, oven uh, for uh, for to reach this temperature for the methane steam reforming. In this oven, we are using fuel gas uh, for to reach this to high to this high temperature, and there will be also emission. So we have to capture this flow gas out of the oven uh, we are getting from, uh, from this flow gas. So if we are uh, capturing this CO2 and utilizing this CO2, uh, converting it to useful chemicals or uh, storing it, in this case, if we are closing the loop, in this case, it is called blue hydrogen. So it is the same as gray hydrogen, but we are in no point at the plant will, be ha uh, will have emission of CO2 to the atmosphere. So in this case, this is called the blue hydrogen. Um, so what was the other question? I'm sorry. Uh, no, I, I, I think that, uh, that, that you give indeed the right, uh, the, the right description of the, of the process, how we can produce the, the, the blue hydrogen, as you, as, as you mentioned. Yes. Uh, so um, because, you know, yeah, I, well, yeah, one of, one of the most things what you ask it, like, uh, why it is, um, like a cool transition, uh, between the gray hydrogen and the, and the, uh, green hydrogen, actually, because it is readily available technology that the production of Gray hydrogen is produced years ago, and it is well established. Uh, so the uh, the only point is to capture this CO2. In the oil and gas industry, capturing CO2 also has a well established technology is known like membrane solvent extraction uh, and absorption. So there is different method available for this CO2 capturing, and also there is some development in the CO2 utilization and storage. So this is why the the blue hydrogen is it can be used for um, uh, for the short term or for the short run, uh, but for the long run, this will be the green hydrogen, the application of green hydrogen and the implementation of green hydrogen technology. Interesting. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, I, again, I, I think it is also interesting. Lots of lots of people think of, of like the blue hydrogen opposing the green hydrogen, but as you kindly mentioned, Rehab, I, I think the 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 it's it's a one story. Uh, right, uh, the blue hydrogen is just playing a role, you know, to help us in accelerating the the, the process of the energy transition. Since basically yeah. we can't wait, you know, uh, for years until until we get this uh, uh, advanced technologies in the water electrolysis side uh, side to help us in 
uh, you know, to produce, uh, you know, uh, uh, the green hydrogen in most, uh, sorry, in a cost effective uh, way. Um, I will stay with you, Rehab, if you don't mind, uh, just to complete uh, the, the, the picture. So now we spoke about the green hydrogen, uh, the different technologies uh, that are, are, are available in the market to produce it. Uh, and now we also spoke about the blue hydrogen uh, in terms of uh, the, you know, how we produce it and why actually it came to the in, you know, energy transition story. So you know, to, to close the loop, I also would like to, to hear your thoughts on the green ammonia. Um, why the green ammonia? Uh, and why, you know, uh, again, it, uh, uh, you know, this cadence also has been created for, for the green ammonia. And, and, and from your perspective, what is the role that the green ammonia actually play, uh, again, in the global uh, 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 fighting against the climate change? So uh, let me uh, first show how we produce ammonia. So ammonia in general is using hydrogen and we get nitrogen from the air. Uh, we, we react together to form a molecule of ammonia. So uh, it is nitrogen H3, NH3. So this means hydrogen reacts with nitrogen from the air to produce ammonia. This hydrogen could be from green sources, from blue, um, blue hydrogen. It could be gray hydrogen, big hydrogen. So according to the color of hydrogen that is used in the manufacturing of ammonia or the sensor of ammonia, the ammonia will be color coded according to this hydrogen. So um, uh, the interesting thing about uh, ammonia uh, that it is actually um, uh, the production is well established, known from um, uh, many decades, uh, which is hyper process. Uh, so um, it is known there is infrastructure for this uh, green uh, green ammonia transportation and the storage. Um, so uh, ammonia is uh, is known for human uh, transportation of hydrogen is uh, is hard. It is not known um, at a very large scale. So um, uh, ammonia actually can be used, uh, can be easily compressed, uh, transported at uh, low pressure with like 10 to 15 bar. Uh, the temperature is it, transported as liquid ammonia in the range of temperature minus 33 degrees Celsius. So um, and using pipelines or, or uh, tankers uh, to transport this ammonia. So. Ammonia is a hydrogen carrier, so um, we can transport or use energy uh, ammonia as an energy storage. So, um, because as I said, it is a known infrastructure. The other way to uh, use uh, ammonia once we once we need this um, this uh, salt or this energy, we can um, use this ammonia uh, decompose the ammonia to hydrogen or electro use ammonia electrolyzer to hydrogen and then we separate nitrogen and hydrogen from each other using separating technology so um, and use hydrogen for um, uh, for in the fuel uh, cell so this is a way to produce um, to use ammonia uh, it is easier than hydrogen for transportation and we can use ammonia uh, to uh, as a carrier for hydrogen the other way to use ammonia is can be used uh, 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 green ammonia is so when I say ammonia, this is green, I mean, green ammonia or whatever ammonia is blue ammonia. So um, ammonia or green ammonia, if we, it can be used uh, in engine as a fuel cell for uh, for generating electricity or an in combustion engine. So we have um, uh, ammonia using in the, uh, in, uh, in the two stroke or four stroke uh, combustion engine, internal combustion engine, and this is actually under development and the main. Uh, branch for using this would be marine engines. Um, the problem uh, here with the uh, with the internal combustion engine actually it is using uh, a flame. So there should be uh, there could be formation of uh, Na2O or NOx, and actually that should be combined with uh, something to um, to stop this or, or to um, uh, convert these uh, emissions to nitrogen and oxygen later. So actually, the ammonia is, is very, very um, uh, potential um, and the candidate uh, uh, and they will make uh, tra uh, uh, the transition to green hydrogen and um, and other facilitate this process. So this is what, um, if, the, if I heard your question. Interesting. No, thanks a lot for help. Uh, I think it's, it's really very clear. Um, I don't know, Carlos, if you can hear us now. 
or you still have issues uh, with your, your microphone. Uh, okay, just a quick reminder to everyone in, in the call that we uh, uh, have booked uh, the last 10 to 15 minutes actually for the Q&A. So if you have any question, questions, please uh, 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 drop them in the chat box. And uh, again, we'll, uh, we'll try, we'll do our best really to answer the vast majority of the questions that we uh, receive towards the end of uh, the session. Uh, so back to my colleagues in the, in the panel. So uh, I think now the story is clear. You know, it is the energy transition. The hydrogen is the tool that we'll uh, actually potentially will use uh, to in this journey of fighting the climate change. Uh, definitely there are challenges. Um, and this is why um, uh, blue hydrogen came to the story. Green ammonia came to the story. Uh, of, of the uh, energy transition. And all of this will, will help again to uh, hopefully uh, get us to uh, the net zero targets that we need to get by 20, 2050. So while we all feel excited about the hydrogen, uh, uh, about the green ammonia uh, uh, industry as well, um, the question to you, Zainab, if, if you don't mind, uh, as as industry expert, and I know John Cockerell is, is well involved in a larger number of green hydrogen uh, projects around the world. It's, from your perspective, as, as, as a key player in this market, what are really the major challenges that this industry actually is facing at the moment? Thank you for addressing this question, because this is one of, uh, of the most, let's say, uh, you know, we are focusing always on problems, solving problems, you know, we, we, don't, yeah. we, don't, uh, we don't spend some good times to, uh, uh, to enjoy the opportunities and good news. So let's talk about uh, challenges. Uh, so one uh, from our talks and discussion and work uh, together in collaboration with different partners and stakeholders, uh, and customers, uh, while uh, they are developing their uh, green hydrogen, green ammonia project, we have collected uh, really interesting input from uh, from the stakeholders. And uh, within also, we are participating to different work uh, uh, package uh, within uh, Euro uh, Hydrogen Europe or France Europe or uh, Hydrogen Council. So we really, we have done a very good job in collecting the input on what 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 are the current challenges? Why uh, why we see uh, a slow speed in 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 making or in flying on uh, seeing this project flying like like we say. So we we come up with the, we have identified we come up with the following outcome. We have identified almost six to seven barriers. I would say some few words on each of these barriers because this is, yeah. I think this is just, the, you know, this is the dialogue, this is the, the story, this is the speeches that you you, you are uh, uh, listening everywhere, you know, like in the World Hydrogen Congress, like Salah have been attending. So there are seven or uh, barriers. So one, the first one, clear cost. Um, the second one is technological maturity of all the technologies that we are talking about, from, from producing green hydrogen, uh, from regarding the infrastructure of hydrogen, all this this, this, uh, this, this part of the, the value chain. Then you have efficiency. So we heard about efficiency. This is clear from technical standpoint, we need to work, all the stakeholders need to work to improve the efficiency of the, of the technology, of the equipment, of the infrastructure. Uh, there is another uh, challenge, which which is renewable energy, so, uh, availability of renewable energy, because this is what is sourcing the green hydrogen production and uh, and at the end the green ammonia production. And you have two other. The remaining two barriers are policy and and the, the regulatory framework. Uh, there is there is kind of uncertainty level at this uh, for this thematic and and and. And the final one that I might uh, maybe uh, the, the well, I'm going to say not uh, not the last at least the standards and certification and the la I, I left the last one which is more related correlated to the financing what we call chicken chicken and egg problem 
Uh, so without financing, you cannot develop project and without prepping project, you cannot. So this is what we call the chicken and egg problem, but this is a known problem everywhere in all, in all sectors. A few words on, on, on some of this, uh, this, uh, of this barrier. So regarding when it comes to cost, we know that the cost, the current cost uh, for of clean hydrogen, I would say low carbon hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen uh, is still high. To, to do to the conventional one to do fossil to do carbon fuel one so not only the cost of the production uh, but the cost of transporting converting storing hydrogen are also high so adopting clean hydrogen technologies for end users can be expensive so but we are work and we are aware of this and we have I think the all players, out of the chain value, they have they're working on their uh, their uh, roadmap to and their cost roadmap to reduce the cost of their technology. Uh, John Cockrell is is also working on this. We have uh, we know what to do and where to uh, fine tune in terms of techn technology aspect to reduce the cost to address uh, the end users uh, uh, needs uh, of uh, of having or using. Uh, low, uh, lower green hydrogen costs. So, uh, so the technological uh, maturity, as I said, the, the alkaline is most known technology, more mature, you see already a huge, uh, let's say, uh, significant installation in terms of megawatts, one, more than 100 megawatts installed in China, for instance. So uh, in terms of maturity, there is still work to do. Uh, some technology in the value chain, not only in terms of production hydrogen, but also in the infrastructure, uh, the, 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 they have still have a low level of technological readiness and need to be proven at scale. Um, so the third barrier, efficiency, as I told you, uh, efficiency, which, uh, you know, convert, converting uh, from the hydrogen production or, or, or infrastructure, from the infrastructure, incur significant energy losses during the, con the hydrogen conversion. If we take like from hydrogen to ammonia as well. So there are, there are uh, quite uh, energy losses at each stage of the value chain. So uh, from the production, transport, conversion and use. So th that's why we need, and this is also on the roadmap of all stakeholders out of the chain one, they're working, everybody's working on improving the efficiency. So the, the, the third, uh, the fourth, uh, the fourth barrier, uh, which I, I mentioned, uh, the, the, the sufficient uh, renewable electricity. So by 2050, if we have some figures uh, about the studies and out of all the uh, published uh, report on, on, on energy outlook, uh, the hydrogen, the, the production of hydrogen with electrolysis may, may, may consume close to 20,000 terawatt hour uh, by 2050. So um, how we are getting, how we need to develop more and more uh, renewable, uh, renewable energy uh, power plant everywhere in order to uh, to come up or let's say to address, address this demand for the green hydrogen production. So uh, as more end user sectors are electrified, a lack of sufficient renewable electricity may become a bottleneck. This is a point that has been highlighted uh, in all meetings and, and, and conferences that uh, there is a, a certain uh, need, uh, high need for to develop and to uh, accelerate the development and the deployment of renewable energy uh, power plants. Uh, when it comes to policy and uh, and uh, regulatory, uh, there is a certain, as I, as I said, there is a point of a certain level of uncertainty. Uh, so, uh, although uh, even that almost more than 140 countries have pledged to achieve net zero emissions within the coming decades, the speed we do see that the speed of these goals uh, to be achieved still remain uncertain. So. There are some work, some roadmap had been uh, uh, had been communicated, uh, but still uh, stable and long term policy frameworks uh, uh, are needed to support such uh, development. Uh, 
um, standards and certification. As I mentioned, this is also another barrier. So uh, all most countries, there is a lack uh, of institutional mechanism to track the production and the consumption of any uh, any hydrogen and identify its characteristic, like origin, uh, where it will be produced, where uh, to track back where the renewable energy has been produced. Is it uh, green or is it you know so? What we call, uh, we we have seen that as, a, or they are uh, they are known under the name of uh, 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 certificate uh, of energy, uh, and this is something that uh, that uh, that work like the work of uh, IRENA or IEA. Uh, there are some studies done uh, about uh, how we can uh, how we can improve the standard and certification. Um, and the, oh, final, uh... the final, maybe the chicken and egg, this is regarding the financing of project. Uh, so this is something that uh, also uh, some fund, investment fund, uh, they are becoming more and more aware and uh, the, mecha the financing mechanism has been, is being now improved. Uh, to address the, this, uh, this investment uh, demand and uh, requirement. So interesting, is, uh, Zainab. Yeah, as, as I mentioned, I mean, it's an uh, exciting time for the hydrogen, uh, mm -hmm. but also there are lots of uh, 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 major barriers and challenges that uh, we have to work on. I mean, the industry, the academia, everyone has to work together really uh, to make sure that we accelerate uh, overcoming uh, the overcoming process over these, uh, these challenges. And uh, um, I see that we have almost uh, 10 minutes uh, uh, stand between us and the Q&A session. Say maybe if in, in, in just a couple of minutes, Zainab, if you don't mind, I will stay with you. Uh, so now we understood the challenges. Could you please you know, also uh, share your thoughts uh, how we can accelerate the whole process of, uh, of advancing this uh, hydrogen economy? Uh, and, and the reason I'm asking because, you know, somebody has set the targets for us, right? Mm -hmm. By 2030, 2035, by 2050, you have to achieve the net, uh, the net zero. So there is really a big need to accelerate the whole process. So uh, again, I will appreciate if you can give us a quick brief in two minutes, your thoughts and, on, on this, please. Okay, so maybe uh, I will start. Uh, I will. I will come back to the the major uh, hurdles and, uh, and 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 barriers that I mentioned, like the cost um, and and policy and infrastructure. So the, the 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 cost point is very relevant here, and I think I believe that all uh, the technology providers for green hydrogen, green ammonia, they are aware of this, and everybody's working on. On, on, on reducing the cost of, of the provided technology, like John Cochrane is working on decreasing the cost of vectorizers, but the cost is also related to how you are designing your, your, your technology and, and your vectorizer. And this is something uh, that we are working very closely with different, uh, not only within the John Cochrane, within the R&D team, but in collaboration with other universities. Um, uh, and one point is very, uh, very significant to, or very important to mention here. This is, uh, it, it, it's not only about the cost, but it's about the e efficiency. And when we want to combine uh, in order to develop uh, better uh, performing electrolyzer, we need to find kind of trade-off between what would be the best efficiency, how we can improve efficiency while we're decreasing the cost. And I think this is the answer to the how we are designing uh, the electrolyzers to, uh, to come up with, the, uh, let's say, to target lower uh, cost of hydrogen production, what we call LCOH, liberalized cost of hydrogen. Uh, we, we need to, uh, to improve the efficiency. Why? Because uh, like in Europe, we know that the price of renewable energy electricity is is, is higher than in other countries, uh, yeah. sunny countries. So uh, the 
Improving efficiency would be uh, uh, means that you reduce the consumption of electricity, and in that way, uh, you are decreasing the overall cost of your hydrogen production. Uh, so we need to find a trade. Uh, when I say trade-off, is like how you are improving the efficiency. It comes to improve the material used. Okay, so material use, that means you have to improve the mat material quality uh, for beta contacting for, 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 uh, in order to reduce the electric consumption. And why you reducing the cost? So this is what we call trade-off. And this will help to, uh, like for European developers, for European uh, project owners, or let's say uh, operators of the green hydrogen and ammonia uh, plant, uh, this will enable to reduce the overall cost of production. So this is this part. I think that the main stakeholders are working on this, and the other part is the infrastructure. So we need to also catalyze the demand because uh, it, it, it should be kind of a, a balance, balancing between the demand and the offer. So when I, when it takes uh, talk the cost, so this is uh, the offer. Uh, perspective. From the demand perspective, we need to uh, develop suitable infrastructures for storage, uh, for transporting the ammonia, the, uh, the green ammonia, and also to, uh, uh, um, to, uh, to, to develop suitable technologies to store uh, the store hydrogen in order to be uh, adequately transported. So in terms of technology... Great. There are some players that are, they are also offering this and they are working on this. So I think that we are on the right way, uh, how uh, in, on the same time we are working on improving things uh, in order to, uh, to make the, the green hydrogen affordable for end users, I would say. Yeah, and interesting, uh, Zainab, th thank you. And I, uh, I mean, the takeaway from what you said is we, parties, players, so definitely the collaboration, uh, you know, uh, that need to be done uh, between the different uh, parties within the hydrogen value chain all over the world, it is really a key. And, mm -hmm. and uh, another element is also the collaboration between the industry and the academia side. And definitely we can't have rehab here in the, in the panel without, uh, you know, asking her the question, how we can make a good use of the capabilities the academia have actually uh, has to support the development of uh, of this of this industry i know that you worked uh, successfully in a great initiative a couple of years ago when you introduced uh, for example uh, uh, you know to to your students uh, uh, the initiative of of working on such uh, uh, clean energy projects and it worked very mm -hmm. well uh, so, keen to hear your thoughts uh, um, uh, uh, rehab i know that we have only 2 minutes left uh, on, oh, on yes. how we can make yeah how we can make this uh, happen. I think Ahmed, Ahmed uh, Dr. Ahmed saying that Q and A also included in the two minutes. So uh, just a, uh, a quick uh, yeah. answer is uh, so uh, so there is through the research and the development uh, section um, in also in the university we can integrate in the development of uh, the electrolyzers, the increasing the hydrogen yield, like test for in the research section. Uh, increase how to increase hydrogen yield, how to reduce the cost of the production, because we know the cost of production can range from $9 or higher to um, uh, $2.5 for blue hydrogen. So um, um, there is some initiative to produce $1 per kilogram, per one kilogram per one decade uh, for the hydrogen. This is one of the initiatives. So um, so this is what, uh, something that the academia can, uh, can uh, uh, contribute built in the hydrogen purity and um, this is something also for the separation the purification technologies all this can also be uh, introduced through the academia uh, through the education and the education of the public um, introducing this concept to the student uh, because they also we want to upgrade the student because they will they will contribute to the market and share in the development of these technologies um, uh, also encourage the startup in renewable technologies and so on. So there is many uh, sections and uh, and fields that uh, the academia and the different universities and research centers in the universities that can share in. So this is a short answer. 
Excellent. I know it's, uh, it is always, uh, you know, exciting when we uh, talk uh, about the hydrogen and we can basically, every time we start this, we can, you know, talk for hours. Okay. But unfortunately, it is what it is. We have to stop now. Uh, and I don't know, Dr. Ahmad, do we have uh, five, ten minutes for the Q&A? The problem we have uh, 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 next panel will start after ten minutes. So just we give them oh. a break for ten minutes. So yeah. uh, we, we, you, you can have like a one minute. Okay. Yeah, I, so think, we'll, uh, I think yeah. time is basically over because we have to have time to get the other uh, <clears throat> panelists in. So great. Yeah, so, so I would like to take this me... opportunity to conclude. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm sure that the organizers will capture all the questions that you uh, have uh, actually sent in the chat box. Uh, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues on uh, on uh, on the panel, uh, Zainab, Rehab, uh, uh, great discussion. I enjoyed it myself. I hope all the attendees I have really enjoyed it uh, as well. Uh, we will... Uh, uh, you know, you have our names, uh, you know, uh, our emails. If you have any questions, please feel free really to reach uh, out uh, uh, to, to ourselves. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, uh, you will enjoy the rest of, of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank and you we very can, much. We can forward, we can capture all the questions and we'll forward them to you. The, the, Dr. Sajori, Sorochi, you are about to say something. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, of course, uh, I, I have just enough even one or two questions. Maybe I will answer on the chat. Uh, and, uh, and I was very pleased to, to join this panel. And thank you. And, and uh, it was a great, a great event. And uh, I, I found this is very important to be connected with the universities and with the students and address their question and their, their topic. Very was very pleased. Thank you so uh, much for very uh, valuable uh, Panel, that was really, really good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a lovely day. Bye bye.